Lecturers from the University of Massachusetts Stockbridge School of Agriculture are teaching students a way to combat climate change through a technique called silvopasture. I sat down with two lecturers in the Sustainable Food and Farming Program to learn more. Carbon farming is a whole suite of agricultural techniques that actually puts carbon back into the soil. And we do that mainly through a few different methods, but um, what we're going to talk about today is using tree crops and integrating animals. And so when we think about traditional industrial farming, it's actually a net emitter of carbon. So it produces about a third of the greenhouse gases that we have today. So in terms of climate change, we're looking at both how can we switch to a, a net zero energy, looking at renewable energy like wind and solar, but we also have to think about what do we do with the carbon that we've already emitted. And so currently we're over 415 parts per million in the atmosphere, and we have to figure out a way to get that back down to 350. And so carbon farming really is an excellent way that we can both be producing food, as well as drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, so explain then, Nicole, what silvopasture is, what that method is. Yeah, so that silvopasture is the intentional integration of animals, trees, and forage. Um, I think it's a misconception that you can just place your animals into the woods and that's called silvopasture. It actually takes commitment from the farmer because they the animals can do a lot more damage to the land um, than benefit if it's not... Uh, managed properly. So the farmer has to know about pasture management or grass ecology. They need to know about animal husbandry. And they also need to know about tree management when they're bringing all these pieces together. Um, it is a timely, uh, sensitive uh, system. So as I said, you need to move your animals before they damage the trees. So it's a practice that not everyone is ready to uh, begin doing, uh, but I think that it's something that is becoming more popular because of the regenerative qualities that it carries. So when you're working with farmers, I mean, describe, you know, sort of like their day-to-day -day what they would have to do. So they'd have a few weeks where the animals could be in a certain spot and then right. they'd have to move them to another acre? It would depend upon what goal they have. So each animal has different benefits, right? Or they have different preferences with eating. So some people want to clear out an area with shrubs and so they might take on goats. And so they want to just get rid of all of those shrubs. That's a great thing. They can just put them in until it's down to a management level. Some people might want to bring pasture back to the woods. Um, so they might put in pigs because they want them to turn over the land a little bit. But if the pigs are left there for too long, then they can damage the root systems. They can create like um, ruts and holes and stuff. So it really depends upon what their focus is. And so another great part of silvopasture is that you are creating a system where you have trees and animals. So you're getting a more diversified um, products out of a smaller piece of land. So, for example, um, at the Agricultural Learning Center, where Lisa and I are co-collaborating on um, this carbon emissions or carbon project, uh, we have chestnuts and sheep together. So right now, we're just receiving every year a product of lamb while the trees are growing. So um, in the future, we're going to be uh, harvesting chestnuts as well. So it's nice because we're getting a product uh, now while we're waiting for the next product to come. So it really is dependent upon what the farmer is wanting to grow, what comfort they have with the animals, and what their goal is with their system. And let, let's talk a little bit about the chestnut trees. Sure. Um, talk about the value of that. So this is sort of a combination effect, right? You have to be able to manage the livestock and move them around. And also you are planting as well. Um, talk about the value of the chestnut trees. Sure. So the chestnuts benefit greatly from the rotational grazing of the sheep. So that's helping with the fertilization of the chestnuts. And also instead of using heavy powered machinery, gas powered machinery that emits carbon emissions, we're actually using the sheep to keep the grass down. So it's a mutually benefic beneficially, um, beneficial system for both the trees and the animals because they're benefiting from the shade as well. 
And so with the carbon, you know, people have heard of chestnuts roasting on the open fire um, during the holiday season. So chestnuts actually used to be about a third of our masting nut crops in the forests. And this is before the chestnut blight. So the chestnut blight came up in around the, the 1900s and devastated the chestnut crop. And so that was a staple crop. It was also used in furniture and instrument making and house building. And it was a big loss um, in, the, in the 1900s. And so since then, the American Chestnut Foundation and other breeders have been breeding a chestnut blight resistant tree crop. And so we finally landed on a hybrid chestnut that's resistant to that blight. And so part of this project is to also bring the chestnut back as a regional staple crop that's a tree crop. So if you think about having corn as a staple crop, um, it has a lot of inputs. So you have to till it every year, you're starting the seed, you're weeding, um, it's, it's a heavy feeder on the soil. And so when we're talking about carbon farming, we're planting that chestnut one time and it's growing and producing nuts for hundreds, they've, if not thousands of years. So they found chestnuts that have been planted in France that's over a thousand years old. Wow. So you um, have a background in farming, you have a family farm, so you're, you're doing both um, jobs. <laughs> is, this, is this realistic for farmers and can this be profitable or do you have to be sort of mission focused? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think having a mission focus is really important. Um, I do find myself that when I am working these systems in my own farm that there's times when I'm so busy and animals need to move and I'm like, ah, like it's just, it's overwhelming at times. But I try and make that a focus. It has to be a focus and it has to be a commitment. You have to say, this is what my intention is and I really want to commit to it. So I think that um, having the other product in mind and knowing that, that it is more of a, like my intention is for a future as well. And sometimes that's hard to farm in that way. But um, changing the land so that it's more of a regenerative practice is really important to me. And so I think it just starts there. It's like, where's your interest lie and if you want to commit to this? Okay. And, and tell us a little bit about the students. I know that they have hands-on and they're working through the summer as well. This must be fun for them. This is great for them. So we're really training the next generation of regenerative farmers. And so um, what students are able to do is they uh, take our classes, they learn about the philosophy and theory and the science behind the practices. And then my students also go a step further where they actually got to design the silvopasture system in a class that I teach that's based on farm design. And then uh, I also worked with a smaller number of students over the summer where they're actually getting to plant and implement um, what they've been learning about and then designing in the classes. So it's a, it's a hands-on practical way where they can go through the whole process.